Welcome to the Laughing Monkey Music Show tonight. We have Wax Mechanics on tonight. How are you doing today? Hey, thanks for having me, Sean. Well, it's a pleasure. You have a, a real nice uh, album or EP out, and you have a little history, too. Back in the day, some old school. So uh, you want to delve into it, and we're going to talk about your old stuff and your new stuff. Great. Um, but first, you have a really interesting name there um, that you go by, moniker. Waxing uh, Ulysses Mechanics. Thank you. Now, is that a family name? No. <laughs> Actually, it is. Actually, oh, nice. it is. I come from a long line of mechanics. And I had a great grandfather that was named Maxim. I have a great grandfather that was named Waxim. And I have an uncle that has the name Ulysses. So you, you, you just win the internet for the night. That was it. That was. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was a, that was a slam dunk. Um, so you have an independent out. Well, actually, not independent album, but it's just you. Most, you're mostly out doing all everything on the album, right? Do you have any? Well, of uh, the uh, the new album uh, called Mobocracy, which is yep. uh, under uh, uh, or released by Electric Talon Records, that has me doing all the writing. I've done some of the guitars. I've done all the drums, some backing vocals, percussion. And I've also enlisted a lot of friends from Philadelphia to play on it as well. So I'm not doing all of the instrumentation or the or the vocal stuff on it, but I'm doing all the writing. It's fantastic. I, you're uh, is Victoria considered like your is the single? Is it the big breakaway sure, song? Think, yeah. yeah, that was the that, most that, recent single that was released by the record company. I mean, it, it'd be a crime if that song doesn't make it as some kind of anthem type sports song or some kind of victory song or something. It's so catchy. It's so good. It's so arena rock sort of, I guess arena rock is a word to say, you know what I'm saying? It's just big. It's loud. It's. Thank you. That was exactly what it was designed to do. There's a bit of a duality to it, but yeah, I wanted it to sort of strike a chord on this visceral sort of primal level. And I'm a big fan of that kind of stuff. And um, from your lips to God's ears, let's hope it gets some traction somewhere. <laughs> I really think you know it should. Um, the right person's got to hear it. So the songs on it. Let's um, let's talk about some of the tracks. All right, we'll go through it. Actually, "Blood in My Eyes." Right. You look the a little puzzled. Yeah. <laughs> the track well, "Blood in My Eyes." Yeah. So uh, what I was trying to do here is uh, "Blood in My Eyes" is they're all just supposed to be. Uh, primal rock songs, because that's the kind of thing I like to do. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to do also was when I was making the album, when I was writing it, I didn't want to just write something that was kind of pedestrian and predictable and obvious. And I wanted to do something that was kind of of and for its time. So as a songwriter, my job is to take stuff in and to give it back in a certain way. That's what I see my job as. And what I was doing is I was kind of wallowing in the stuff from 2016 on and I saw how people were angry and people were afraid and people were kind of at each other's throats. And I was taking all that in and I didn't mean to write that kind of stuff. But then I found myself writing these songs and the second one that I wrote that's on Mobocracy was Blood in My Eyes. Every sheep has a shepherd that steps into the light. I mean, that says a lot about those yeah. people that I guess we kind of uh, elevate, right? So, I was the lyrics to... are really are really good in that, and that's why I kind of want to go through the songs. You know, I like to go through the songs anyhow and get the artist's feedback on their own stuff. And you know, it's, sure. it's you're not assuming it. Um, so your next song is victorious. I could say your album has songs, and I can hear I hear influences or sounds like I can't date it. You can't say it's from this time period. I think that's really a really interesting thing to do. I can hear pieces like I could hear that piece from the 80s I could hear that from now I could hear that from this genre of music I feel I hear a lot of different pieces in it to make right. its own sound which is a really hard thing to do um is there any artists that kind of influenced you on this sound or is this kind of something you kind of just kind of just poured out of you well the general view was what I wanted to accomplish with the record was really simple I wanted to incorporate my history my influences and I'm in my 50s, so you and I kind of grew up with the same kind of stuff. And what I also wanted to do was to incorporate some current things. Now, specifically, 
uh, on um, Victorious, as long as we're talking about it. Yeah, that's what we're going Some to. of my friends that were that played on it are really current musicians. There's a band uh, that's signed to Mascot Records that is a band called Crobot. And they're a contemporary band. They're sort of a groovy, funky, heavy mm-hmm. kind of band. And those fellows are in their late 20s. And uh, so they brought all their influences to the record. So I'm friends with them and uh, asked them to be on it. Those two fellows are Brandon Yeagley on vocals and Chris Bishop on guitar. So I had that side of the coin. And then the other side was some of my friends that are in my age group that grew up on the kinds of things that I liked and are great musicians. Tom Altman is a guitar player and a bass player. Um, Pop Sewell was a great guitar player and they're all my age and they brought their influences. Uh, so I wanted to span all the kinds of things that I was interested in that influenced me. And I wanted to bring them to the record in a tangible way by bringing those players in that could execute it. So that's what I was trying to well, do. It, it's interesting because the album actually, it plays like a, like a band. Yes. Or like you, or you just did everything because it was all uniformly in, in you pouring out. It doesn't sound like an eclectic bunch of like, I had a guest come on and there's a solo on here. You're like, oh, I know that solo from that band. It feels like it was, it was you know, formed cohesively together through the whole thing. Like I would have known that if I just heard the album as, well, as, as it is. Yeah, you know? the goal obviously to any record that I would make would be to make it sound like it's a, it's a collective group of folks that enjoyed playing together that are sharing something. Now, technology sometimes limits us in terms of, you know, you record the drums first and the bass second, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. But what I wanted to really try to do, and it really wasn't hard because I, I, I know these guys well enough that, and they know the goal of the, the songs and the records well enough and the influences and what I was trying to do that we didn't really, uh, we didn't really sit around and contrive anything. It was turn it on, turn it up and play along as if we're all in the same room. And they're good enough at doing that, that they can pull it off. Obviously, when we you know, play live, it's a whole different thing, and it's a whole different animal than making a record. So yeah, yeah. They're, they're two separate things. Um, all Freaks? Yeah. <laughs> that was the, 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 the single that the record company, Electric Talon, wanted to lead off with because it was aggressive, and it was short, and it was concise. Mm-hmm. And there, there's no guitar solo in it. And I love that about it. If you listen to it, you know, my genre that I'm dealing in is all about guitar solos and flashy, uh, flashy shredding and showing off. And one of the reasons that I wanted to have this song on there was because it was short and concise. And that shows one of the influences that I really uh, wanted to bring to the, uh, to the table. I'm mostly known as a hard rock kind of guy, but if you listen closely, mm-hmm. there's a lot of punk influence in there. Uh, the MC5, mm-hmm. the Ramones, Sex Pistols, that kind of stuff. And specifically, I remember when I wrote that particular song, I was uh, uh, in my Elvis Costello phase. I get fascinated, like we all do, with particular artists, and uh, you just live with them all the time. And I remember writing All Freaks when I was in the middle of uh, an Elvis Costello uh, jag. He... Uh... Was it was it the time when he was spinning the uh, the wheel? I was just talking to somebody else about the two, the big wheel of tunes. To have that many songs that are so popular on stage, you can actually just spin the wheel, and your band knows all of your songs. And he has like twenty or thirty albums. It is ridiculous. He's a he's an amazing he's an amazing songwriter. Obviously, uh, legendary and iconic. Uh, I'm not trying to hold myself up to people like Elvis Costello or compare myself to to them. As an influence, absolutely. How you pick up a guitar and want to write a song, and you know if you're sort of in my generation doing my kind of stuff, how you cannot be influenced by Elvis Costello is a mystery to me. Well, I think, yeah, the All Freaks, there's a difference. And I, and I think most releases, if you ever noticed, those like the, the Fist, the Brick Wall coming out as a first single. Yep. Usually the, the the bigger potential song is usually like the second or third. They have a, they actually have a system, it feels like, and you ever hear, you know, as bands have done it, it was maybe less nowadays, but I mean, back in the 80s and 90s, you could just tell which song is going to go in which order? Sure. I could. Um, so that makes sense that they do that. Be, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's like saying, hey, we're here. This is yep. good. This is a good song. It's a strong song for the album. This is kind of what we're about. Everyone's like, oh, okay. And then you're like, you like that? 
check this out. You know what I mean? That was kind of like what we wanted to do. Yeah, it's not rocket science. And absolutely, uh, that approach is what we took. Um, the guys at Electric Talon uh, said, we need something that really, you know, sticks a flag right in the dirt, mm -hmm. right in front of people and saying, this is a rock record and it's going to be aggressive. It's going to be uh, interesting from a lyrical standpoint and it's going to be hooky and uh, it's going to be full throttle. And that should grab the attention of the listener. So I was all about it. You know, when you make them, I get too close to them and I really wasn't sure what should have been released first, second or third. And frankly, that really wasn't what I saw my job as. And that's mm -hmm. why the guys at the record company were so cool. So, so far, so good. Uh, I think it's great. Um, Mad World. Mad World. Well, that one. It's a uh, shame it's such a so short song too. The song just goes by so fast. <laughs> yeah. well, the joke is it's, it's a long song. Interestingly enough, uh, if you, uh, I think we t chatted about it. In the 80s, I was part of a, uh, an American cult rock band called Nitro, not those hair band fellas from the 80s, from the late 80s, from LA. We were from central Pennsylvania and uh, we came up and uh, started in 1980. I said all that to say that um, I'm still, I still play with Nitro. I'm still part of that band, uh, although we take long periods between when we record and when we play. And uh, when I was writing this album, I decided that uh, I should show it to the guitar player in Nitro, and his name is John Hazel. And I've known John for 40 years. So I just have to give him a general sketch and off he goes. So whenever I was putting the record together, I talked to John and I said, I really hear you on this. I wanted to reference early 80s stuff that he's really good at, sort of like Ozzy Osbourne from the first two records. I wanted to have that feel and John's great at that. And I also wanted to put a little bit of interesting eclectic stuff in it as well from a percussion standpoint. So my producer, Electric, jazzed it up a little bit and brought it into the 21st century. So Mad World was written uh, uh, with John Hazel. And uh, if you listen to it closely, um, it can be from the standpoint of somebody that is either liberal or conservative saying, wow, things are pretty funky right now, aren't they? And that's what I was trying to get across with the whole record. I do feel that your album allows people to take it. It doesn't take a side. It's more of a right. statement. And an I, then. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't taking that kind of stand because I didn't think uh, it wasn't that I was afraid. It was that I wanted to make sure that I was making this, uh, making a record that was reflective of the times. And if you listen closely to them and dig into the lyrics a little bit, then you'll see that they can be viewed from a conservative or a liberal or an independent standpoint. What I wanted to get across was that this, these are rough, weird, aggressive times, and here's how we're all sort of viewing it. So uh, I purposefully designed it so that it didn't take a stand. So I'm glad that you got that out of it. Well, not only do I think it doesn't take a stand, I think when you listen to lyrics, people always interpret them to themselves to a moment to themselves, like, oh, uh, this song or this song. So. Not only do you, I hear this, I don't even feel like there's a side to take it. I just feel like it's like you're like you're learning, like you're hearing something, like it's a statement, like you're reading something. Like I don't even feel like I need to put my opinion on it. It, it feels like it's just reflecting what's going on, right? Which is even better because you know it's it's more of a it's timeless that way, you know. Yeah, well, I I knew that uh, for there was a danger of having it locked in time. I didn't want it to be a, an album that was locked in a particular time. Whether I've accomplished that or not, we'll see. I also wanted to make sure that when I designed it, I didn't take a political stand or a social stand. I wanted it to be uh, interpretable from anyone's perspective so that no matter what your persuasion was, you could see some of yourself in it. And I mm -hmm. think I accomplished that. And most of my life I've sort of, uh, I've lived in both camps, frankly. Uh, so I, I know people in both camps pretty well and have been those people at different times in my life. So I felt like I had the uh, moral authority to do that. You know, it, it, I think what's gonna happen is a lot of albums are gonna come out and you're either gonna have people that have really strong opinions, real political albums, real that, real this, and, and some I may agree with or not. What's gonna happen is there's gonna be, a, let's think of everything else, there's gonna be a point where it's gonna be a large amount and whether they become dated for that moment or they just can kind of move on from it. If you're not locked, locked, locked into that time, oh, the COVID album, or this, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I just, you know, you're like, I just released an album in 2020 or 2021, what are the dates? You know what I'm saying? Just in general, or, or you're like, oh, that was the album that so-and-so released 
that was their COVID album. So yeah. with this album, it's not really a, an album of the time of, of, there's not a stamp on it. You know what I mean? It's a I statement. didn't want it to be locked in time so that people could right. move on from it. I'd like for it to, frankly, I have to be honest with you, Sean, I wasn't making it for anybody really other than myself. My, well, when I do this, to. I just do it for me. I know that sounds like a cliche, but the kind of, uh, kind of song songwriter that I am, I find that my best work comes when I don't think of anybody else, but uh, I do it to satisfy me. And what I wanted to do is when I was writing it and recording it, I wanted to make sure that when I looked back on it in 10 years that I was still going to be proud of it. And I know that that's, that's going to be the case, whether or not anybody else responds to it, it's another story. And that'd be gravy, frankly, if it happens. When I, when I hear it, you know, I actually don't tied to anything but that. I actually used to be like, oh, that makes me think, like I hear the lyrics and I'm like, for women, like, oh, that makes me think of Reaganomics. Oh, this makes me think of the Iran system. Or, oh, this makes me think of this. Like it flashed into like a bunch of different ideas yep. from the lyrics, but not a specific time for me. Right. You know, right, right, the first time I heard it, I was like, oh, that makes me think of that or that or that. Like it wasn't, and then I hear it again. I'm like, oh, it's also for that. It could be for this too. So it, it's pretty fluid. It's not, you know, got a linear feel to it. If um, we do a good enough job as songwriters, and musicians, then it'll have some shelf life to some, a long shelf life to it. Um, that's really not the goal, uh, really. Uh, it's to satisfy myself and be able to look back on it in 10 or 15 years and still be proud of it. So I think it could be. Uh, Ghostland? Yeah, uh, well, Ghostland, obviously, uh, it was all about the groove. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun to do. What I was trying to do was to break things up dynamically as well. And I'd been playing with that particular group for quite a while. And um, one, of, uh, one of my great influences is Neil Young. And you'll hear some Neil Young in there. But it's like uh, high velocity folk music is what I do. So uh, those kinds of people influence me quite a bit. Uh, Ghostland is, is certainly about those people that are feeling disenfranchised, whether they're on the left or whether they're on the right. It's people that I know that we all know that uh, are feeling sort of left behind. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was trying to convey there because I felt like that quite a bit uh, in my life and uh, had that song laying around for a while. And it really did come together probably about 2017. And um, it, was, uh, uh, it was really souped up by my guitar player friend who's Tom Altman. So I, I brought this sort of timid song to him and he, he really did juice it up quite a bit and put a nice bluesy influence to it and, and a, a nice bite and uh, the groove sort of happened. And that's one of those examples when things kind of come together in the studio. Mm -hmm. So uh, Tom Altman is uh, my go-to guy for that kind of thing. He's about my age and his influences are vast and, and he can pull them out pretty easily and quickly. Uh, lyrically, uh, it's, it's certainly about the disenfranchisement that I think lots of the people that I have bumped into over the past few years are feeling. So I'm pretty connected to that. I like how the, uh, I like how the album actually goes time. Each song gets longer and longer too. Is that? Yes. Yeah. We wanted to see if we could start by, I have to be honest with you. It, it, it was a bit of a design that let's see if we can get them interested get them on to the next song and then make each one just a little bit longer. So that by the time you get to the end, they'll be with you the whole time. <laughs> so it's, it was a bit deliberate. I didn't want it to be manipulative, but uh, I know the attention spans, you know, whenever you and I were buying albums in the seventies, you'd sit there and you'd be committed to the whole thing, regardless of what it was. That's not the way it works mm -hmm. anymore. So I wanted to make sure that I served both camps. I certainly didn't want to compromise my own desire to make an album. Uh, you know, making singles is fun and, and I do that as well. But uh, I wanted this particular record, Mobocracy, to, to be that kind of form. It's, I, I love it because I've never noticed a band to do that. So it's kind of fun when I saw that. I was like, I like that. Um, Thanks. I'm glad the, you The last song uh, is uh, Black. Right. Well, Black obviously is, uh, is, is sonically different. And I, it was important that I had that one on there because that's a big part of who I am, that sort of approach. I really, and am, if I'm known for anything, it's being part of a snarling, strident, howling rock band, right? Guitars, bass, and drums turned up to 11. And uh, there's another side that I wanted to get across that I thought was important, stuff that appealed to me, that still does appeal to me, is when uh, the artists that I like to follow shift gears a bit and show me a different side to them. 
and you know the obvious ones are Led Zeppelin, you know those kinds of people. Um, uh, they'll they'll have some heavy tracks on it, and then there'll be this uh, uh, really interesting, delicate, intricate acoustic thing. But I didn't want it to be pretty, and I wanted black to to fit in the record and to make a statement about uh, that sort of uh, Paul that was overtaking people that I was running into as I was writing the songs and making the records. So a lot of it was uh, uh, a lot of it seems a bit dark, but I, I I tried also to give it a bit of light as well. So black specifically is a deliberate nod to my audience to say, here's what's coming next. If you listen to the album in sequence, Black is last. So I'm in the process of making another album now that's going to be much like Black is in terms of its sonics. So well, the first to... thing is you, you should have a sticker on it that says, be aware of your speed, your speed while you're driving your car and you're listening to this album. Because <laughs> I almost really? got a ticket. Because <laughs> you really get into it, and there's some songs are pumping, and they change the pace, but you kind of like you kind of like lose where you're at because you just kind of feel like you're on a journey, you know. And that's what a good album does. So yeah, I had to watch my speed. So thanks. <laughs> you didn't get ticketed, did you? No, 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 I didn't. But I realized that's called. <laughs> and and Especially that's a compliment. That's and thank you, uh, because those kinds of uh, you know, in any art that we want to get lost in, Absolutely. we want it to transport us somewhere, and hopefully it's not. To the Hooskow after you've gone too fast. Well, yeah, I mean that, that that's how a good album. I mean, when I do take time and I listen to an album, I listen to that. There's a couple a couple of litmus tests I'll do. You know, I listen to it in the in my car. You know, listen to it at work. There's like different levels of music for me. You know, some music is good in the background. Some music is good for at work. Some good in the car. You know, I mean, it just depends. You know what I mean? Yep. And that's just me. I got rules. I, I think some albums I only listen to on vinyl too, but that's just me. <laughs> well, um, I think anybody that likes great music. They they use it for different things. Sometimes it's as background music, as background noise. Other times, you're it's a focused effort to get involved in it and see what that artist is doing. And then there are other times when it's for letting off steam, like you did in the car. You know that that kind of thing is great too. And I have to be honest with you, even though it sounds a little uh, like a big bite and a bit pretentious, I wanted it to to do both of those. Like Victorious uh, was one of those songs where I wanted to satisfy both both parts of that you know I wanted it to be something that you didn't have to listen to actively but yet if you wanted to you could and yeah. I think most artists want to do that in general you know we this all one like had more to pull to, to, I felt like I had it on I kept stopping I and mean, I tried it at work you know what I mean I, I, I was like oh I kept getting pulled away from it because what I was having a hard time making it background background like sounds or noise like you know you'll see music you're like oh I've heard it it's fine I can kind of tune it out and, and I think that's more of a testament to the song itself like i couldn't push it away i wanted to get back into the song again you know i'm looking for forward to so playing them live because that's more of a tribal experience and people even though they do and i do i listen closely at at live performances at concerts but in other cases i will listen i'll take my time to get to know the record before i show up at the show because that is a different experience and i wanted to make a record that could serve both purposes so all those great records that I loved did that for me. So that was my goal was to be a link in a chain and to be an artist that did that. Mm -hmm. And did we accomplish it? We'll see whenever COVID breaks and we can get out and gig a little bit and see how people respond. But uh, interesting part about doing this in a pandemic and we were just gonna put it off until this thing cleared up. And I, I said, you know, let's put it out now because it's timely it's supposed to be out now the other thing is it will give people time to absorb it that want to and then when we gig live they can just you know loosen the collar and let off some steam if i've done a good enough job at designing it properly that'll happen so i'm interested in that other part of it i think it, i think it, i'm looking forward to hearing your next album I, I like this one i'm still still fresh on this one i think i think people need to go out and get it um it's great so you said you can do some live that was the question I know because it's mostly you doing the writing and you have people coming in. Yep. Same people going to do the live thing or do you have an idea for like a live band? Oh, uh, I'm putting that together now and everyone is chomping at the bit. Um, probably won't be the same people on uh, playing live as are on the record because <laughs> they've got their other, they've got their own things going on. Right. Like those fellas from Crobot, I think they're going to be making a new record soon for, uh, for their, uh, for their label. So will we have a chance to play together? I sure hope so. Um, but yeah, the goal is to put together a snarling, howling, slamming band that can interpret the songs 
the this record and the other songs that I'm known for, for those people that are interested in me. So we've got, you know, a whole bunch of Nitro records I can I can mine if I want to. What I'm really going to try to do, though, is I'm going to try to uh, um, do mostly uh, my solo stuff. Writing songs isn't the problem. I, I've got more than enough songs for, for a long show. So it's getting them recorded properly and putting them in the right context. So um, right now I'm uh, putting together a band and hopefully we'll be getting to do some stuff in the summer. Fingers are crossed if everything goes well, but we're not going to do it until we can do it safely. Yeah. Well, we got the rundown of this band and it's good. And there's more stuff. We'll touch at the very end. We'll touch back just on like you got anything going on. While we talk about Nitro and it's sure. still an active unit, let's just a little bit, let's, let's run us off on of Nitro. Give me a little bit of the history so the fans know and we can kind of re I have checked them out. I do want to say it's got the, the, uh, the old school, Man, I, I'm gonna get penalty for that that word. Um, <laughs> yeah, we allowed to use that word. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm so I'm, old. I'm, I don't not, know. I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of it. Um, to be honest with you, so uh, Nitro. Uh, first of all, some of the folks listening might think of Nitro as the the big hair band that was all glam. Yeah, it's not the the on. Jim Gillette and. Um, yeah. Uh, 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 I can't think of his name. The Mike Landlo uh, Botello, I think. Thank you. His name. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So great guys love that kind of stuff. Had those records, still have them, but that's not us. <laughs> so yeah. they formed in Los Angeles in the late 80s, and they were all part of that glam thing that happened then. Uh, we started in uh, 1980. We formed in 1980 in Pennsylvania, in the central part of Pennsylvania. And we were coming up about the same time as Metallica and Anthrax and uh, those kinds of folks. I'm not comparing us to them because our pedigree is obviously more modest than that. We made some independent records. Uh, we were signed to a Belgian label in the early 80s. Um, we were found on the pages of Kerrang! and all the magazines in the UK and Europe uh, in the early 80s when we released a, a small homemade EP called Lethal. So it was a four-piece band and we had a great time for probably about six years and um, then we went our separate ways and got our Clark Kents and um, still are a band, still record periodically, uh, release some records here and there. And you can find us all over the internet if you like, but we're this little cult thing, I think is what the best way to put it, is we're called a bit of a cult band. So we took all the British influences and the European influences in the late, from the late seventies and we filtered them through our American lens and we were also fans of the great American rock bands too. Uh, you know, Boston, Aerosmith, Van Halen, that kind of stuff. And we brought it all together and we were sort of the Americans, uh, Americans answer to the new wave of British heavy metal is what I've seen it's called before. Uh, the pedigree is really modest. We've had some interesting records. I'm a bit shocked that we, and puzzled by the fact that we even have this pedigree, but the records are relatively well respected. The technology was different in the 80s. It was all analog. Yeah. And we were all in the same room at the same time, uh, like you were alluding awesome. to earlier. But that was great. It was it was a different animal. Um, you know, we were in our late teens, early 20s at the time. So um, uh, it was all learn the song well, know your song well before you start singing. And that's what we tried to do. And we made those records analog uh, and ended up getting a little bit of traction. And now we're known as this interesting little asterisk in the heavy metal world of American rock. And it's a lot of fun. And the guys are still, we're all still friends. We still play together periodically. Uh, it's me, I was on drums. Uh, John Hazel, the guitarist. Dana Confer, lead vocals. And uh, Brad Gensmore on bass. Great guys, we're still brothers. And uh, hopefully we'll record some more. And I was mentioning on That'd that, great. John played on it, yeah. That would be great. Um, well, you, you sound, yeah, I know you're not, you're not comparing yourself to any of those bands, but you do, there is a sound of the contemporaries of that age that you guys have, the early metal sound. Yep. I think that's why you, people still talk about you guys. I was surprised I hadn't heard of you guys before. I think maybe to the negative was hearing Nitro. They have stopped a lot of people from hearing, they hear one thing, so you like that kind of music and you don't hear. So, you know. Well, I'd like to take uh, credit for for the name, but... <laughs> John and, and Brad thought it up and we kind of stuck with it. So um, it, it worked at the time, you know, 
that is definitely a 19 early 1980s kind of experience. I mean like the confusion with the other bands so like people like oh I know Nitro or, you know what I mean yeah. like yeah. around the same time band there's a lot of bands that same name no no way to it's such a common word that, and if you search a little bit you'll see there are all kinds of bands named that all over the planet uh we just managed to you know get a little bit of a foothold and release a couple of records and uh then they came along and were signed to a major label and did really well and they were at the peak of uh MTV that kind of thing we were done by then pretty much all right that's, that's awesome I, th I want to thank you for being on the show tonight um all your stuff everything you've talked about all your links we're gonna put underneath so people can check it out I want people check out the album it's it's, it's really good I really, I really like it I listen to it quite often actually it's on my my rotation now on, on my on uh my apple list thanks i'm flattered um, when you get your new album out or you do some touring we yep. will have you back on we'll talk about it right super wanna, sean this I has been a real pleasure thank you very much oh thanks for being on the show man sure